So today we're going we're gonna to start a, a new series of sermons, and it's going to be about prayer. How many of you think maybe I need to know more about prayer? Well, we're going we're gonna to look at that over the next four weeks. We're going to see some specific things that the Lord has to say about prayer. And, and we're gonna, hopefully we're going to learn some things about not only that we're supposed to pray, I think that's a given, but maybe some things about how we're supposed to pray, why we're supposed to pray, um, to whom we're supposed to pray, some things like that. So we're going to look at that and um, see what a high priority God places on prayer. So the title of the lesson today is, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. We're going to start with Luke chapter 11, verse number 1. Luke chapter 11, verse number 1. Luke wrote this. This is a pretty incredible little statement of Scripture. It says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. What a request. Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your goodness and your grace and your love and your mercy. For Jesus, Lord, for your word. You've given it to us. You've preserved it down through the ages. We have multiple copies of it available to us. And then you invite us, Lord, even more than that, you command us to study it, to memorize it, to meditate on it, to just engraft it into our souls so that we can be strengthened in our inner man and become more and more of the men and women that you want us to be. Lord, send your Holy Spirit today to teach us from your word what you want us to know so that we can better obey you be more blessable and more usable. Because I ask that in Jesus' name and for his sake. And amen. amen. So by the time the disciples uttered the request that they made in this verse that we just read, they had come to understand that there was a connection between the wonderful public life of Jesus and his secret prayer life. They had been with him and had seen him pray. They had heard him pray. And in fact, um, evidently, they were hearing him pray moments before one of the disciples asked this question, and he evidently asked it on behalf of the group. And that's why Luke wrote, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, because they were right there overhearing his prayer, when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, and then he makes this request on behalf of the group. He says, Lord, teach us, not teach me, but teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. You see, they had learned to believe in Jesus as a master in the art of prayer. No one else could pray like him. So intense and so direct were the prayers of Jesus that on one occasion... In fact, on, on this occasion that Luke wrote about, when the Lord had finished praying, one of the disciples turned to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And when they heard him pray, they knew that Jesus had been in touch with God, and they wanted to learn to pray like he prayed. How many of you would say, man, I'd like to be able to pray like Jesus prayed? For far too many people in our world today, Prayer is regarded as simply uh, a religious tradition or a routine religious activity. They really have no sense of prayer as coming into the very presence of God. To them, prayer is simply a formality. Thousands of people pray only in times of great crisis or danger or uncertainty. The Apostle Paul, although, said, pray with ceasing. In other words, there's never stop praying. Now, anything so consuming in the Christian experience that would warrant a statement like that, never stop doing it, must be understood. Of all the spiritual disciplines Jesus tells us to engage in, prayer is the only one about which he said, never stop praying. I want to tell you a little story. I was a very young pastor. I was pastor in the second church I ever pastored. I was probably 19, maybe 20 years old at the time, and 
I had gone to the hospital because somebody in the church had had uh, an accident and they were in the emergency room and so I had gone into the emergency room, ministered to that family, prayed with them. Uh, it wasn't a real serious deal, but you know, I was there and I prayed for them. Well, it was obvious that on the other side of the curtain, there was a the family over there just really, really out of control. I mean, they were in a state of panic over the accident that had happened to their loved one and they didn't even know how serious it was yet but they were just kind of over the edge and so I stepped across and 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 I said you folks um, seem like you're in a panic um, could I pray with you and this lady said oh my god has it come to that <laughs> you know what that means that means we only pray if it's a last resort, desperate kind of issue. Unfortunately, many people treat prayer exactly like that. And so what we need to do is we need to learn that, the, the, that Paul wrote this to the believers at Thessalonica, and if it was applicable to them, it's applicable to us. We need to pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Pray about the big things. Pray about the little things. Pray about everything in between. Pray when things are going good. That Pray when things are not going good. Just pray. That's what he tells us to do. But you see, if we don't know how to pray or for what to pray, <laughs> it does a little good to pray. Therefore, we should plead with the Lord just like that unnamed Jewish disciple of Jesus did when he said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so we need, to, we need to just grab hold of that and understand how vitally important prayer really is. As we meditate on the words of this disciple's simple request, Lord, teach us to pray, we can discover a wealth of practical treasure just in that simple request. And that's what I want us to talk about in the balance of our time together. We're going to talk about um, the stuff we can learn just from that request, as simple and fundamental as it may seem, we need to be taught to pray. Wasn't that his request? He didn't assume he already knew how to pray. I mean, he was a believer. He had been baptized by John the Baptist. He was following Jesus and had probably followed Jesus for a couple of years at this time, heard him teach, saw him work miracles. I mean, he was out there on the cutting edge of what was going on in the kingdom of God in that day and time but he still realized that he needed to be taught to pray. Even though in one sense prayer is so simple that even the youngest child can do it, at the same time it's so complex and holy that God considers it the highest spiritual achievement to which a man can rise. And that's why Jesus' first century Jewish disciple made the request, Lord, teach us to pray. Sometimes prayer can be very simplistic. Sometimes prayer gets really complicated, depending on what the issue is. Sometimes it's so complicated that we don't even know what to pray for. You ever been there? God, I know you need to do something here. I just don't know what it is. Is it okay to pray like that? Sure it is. And so we need to understand that. But then on the other hand, it can be so simple. Uh, Jenny and I went to, I think we were in our mid-20s, and we went up, we, we left northeast Arkansas, we went up to central Indiana, we planted a church up there, God bless, the church grew, some good things happened, and we were having about, I don't know, 90 to 100 people in church in our house, um, and we had this little kids class in the dining room, and so we had this, this guy in the church that was uh, teaching the little kids, and, and so um, when he got ready to start the class this particular day, he said, well, we need to pray, so um, I want somebody, I want one of you guys to lead us in this prayer because you need to learn how to do this. And so he called on this little boy named Denny, and Denny was really just a little guy. So, Denny, say a prayer for us. Ask God to help us with our class today. And everything got really quiet, and Denny prayed, Lord, help us. And that was the extent of his prayer. You ever prayed like that? Lord, help us. That's the way he prayed. Was that a legitimate prayer? Absolutely, absolutely, coming from the mouth of a babe. Now, so, so we need to be taught to pray. Now, 
And prayer can be very simple, prayer can be very complicated, but unfortunately, a huge segment of God's people today don't understand exactly what prayer is. And, and I know this is true, because often when I ask people to define prayer, they say something like this. They say, well, a prayer is talking to God. And talking to God can be prayer, but just because you're talking to God, does that necessarily mean what you're talking to him about qualifies as prayer? Not necessarily. You see, simply talking to God is a poor definition of prayer because you can talk to God and ask him to do what you want him to do rather than what he wants to do. You get that? How many of us are guilty of that? We talk to God and we tell God all of the stuff that we want him to do. God, I, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and I want you to do something else, and I want you to give me this, and I want you to give me that, and I want you to give me something else. Does that really qualify as prayer? No. Because we're told in Scripture that authentic, real, genuine prayer is when we're asking God to do what God already wants to do. When we're asking Him to do His will, not our will. And we need to see that. We need to understand that, and it might be eye-opening if you categorized all the prayers you've prayed in the last couple of days and make two categories, what I want and what God wants, and see which category is the longest when you really analyze your prayers. It might be eye-opening for us. It might revolutionize the way we pray. And if we're just asking God to do what we want rather than what he wants, that really doesn't qualify as prayer. So let's define prayer from a biblical perspective. Prayer is simply asking God to go ahead and do what he already wants to do. It's asking him to do his will right here on planet earth. Jesus explained this definition of prayer when he gave the disciples what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. And you've got to remember this is, a, this is a, a, a prayer that he taught them to pray during that age of the gospel of the kingdom. And when he asked them to pray that prayer, he was giving them an appropriate prayer for them to pray at the time in which they lived. It was some things in it are applicable to us. Some things are not applicable to us who live in the time of the gospel of the grace of God. But this is how he taught them to pray in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. He said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You see, it's the gospel of the kingdom. So your kingdom come, and then what? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whose will be done? Your will be done. You see, prayer is not designed to be a mechanism by which we can twist the arm of God and manipulate Him to do what we want done. Prayer is designed to be a mechanism by which God can change our hearts and cause us to want Him to do what He wants to do. And that's how we're supposed to pray. Thy will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Uh, it's essential that we learn to pray because there's power in prayer. The eternal power of heaven is made available to those who pray. James wrote this in James 5.16. He wrote, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. There really is power in prayer. Now, sometimes we misunderstand that, and we think that power in prayer means that if I ask God to do what I want him to do, then somehow he's obligated to do it, and he's going to do it because, after all, I asked him to do it, and I even asked in Jesus' name. Just because we tag that little phrase in Jesus' name on the end of it, does that necessarily mean that we're going to get what we ask for? Not if it's what we want instead of what he wants. You know, that's not a magic formula where, where we can somehow obligate God to do what we want him to do because we put Jesus' name on the end of it. No, authentic, legitimate prayer is just a prayer that says to God, God, I want you to do what you need, know needs to be done in this situation. And it may look to me like you need to do this, and if I'm right, Father, then do it. But if I'm not right, then you do what you know needs to be done. That's real prayer. It's praying for his will to be done. And there's power in that kind of prayer. After making that bold statement there in James 5, 16, that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, then Jesus offered an, an example of a powerful prayer. I wish I could pray like this. This is what, this is what he said. 
It's in James 5, 17 and 18. He says Elijah was a human being. You remember Elijah the prophet. He was a human being, even as we are. He's saying there that Elijah wasn't any different than us. He had a special calling from God. God had given him special gifts as a prophet, but he was just a human being like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Wow. Was that a powerful prayer? You know why that prayer was so powerful? Because that's what God wanted to do, and Elijah simply asked him to do what God already wanted to do. He was going to bring this drought on the land in judgment of the nation of Israel because they had gone into idolatry and they were killing the prophets and they were doing all kinds of stuff. And so Elijah just lined up with God and said, God, these people need to be judged. You know they need to be judged. Let them have a drought for three and a half years. And God did it. And then again he prayed. This is evidently three and a half years later. Now, I'm not sure that um, he didn't pray in the meantime. But he prayed about this issue again three and a half years later. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. That's two pretty powerful prayers, isn't it? One stops the rain, and the next one starts it. Why? Because that's what God wanted. And and Elijah was in tune with the heart of God, knew what God wanted to do, and simply asked God to do what God wanted to do anyway. So there is power in prayer. Perhaps a contributing factor to the powerlessness of most modern churches is that we have not learned to pray. Maybe that's true. Despite God's promise of the power of prayer to unleash a mighty work of God in this world, most churches in the world are currently starving in the area of prayer. Rick Warren, uh, well-known evangelical pastor and author, the guy that wrote The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life, he wrote this. In Acts chapter 2, they prayed for 10 days. Peter preached for 10 minutes, and 3,000 were saved. Today, churches pray for 10 minutes, preach for 10 days, and three get saved. Is that pretty accurate? I want you to think about it. Jesus never taught his disciples how to preach. I mean, you can look through the whole book, and and he tells them to go preach, but he never taught them how to preach. They evidently learned their preaching style from just watching him, but he never really taught them how to preach. I can't find any record of that, but he did teach them how to pray. What does that tell you? It tells me this. Knowing how to speak to God is more important than knowing how to speak to men. You get that? In fact, unless you know how to speak to God, you're probably not going to be very successful at speaking to men. And I think that's the situation that most of the modern church is in today. Now, in answer to the request of this unnamed disciple, Jesus then taught a lesson on prayer that is forever relevant for those who long to learn to pray like he prayed. Uh, the, the prayer lesson he taught is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. I like Matthew's version of it best, so let's read it. Um, he said this, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then he closes with the word amen, which means let it be so. That's Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Now you see, this was actually a model prayer that the Lord recited in answer to the request of his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. It was a prayer lesson for them. Now, I I won't get into any depth about this in today's lesson, but this is a prayer lesson that Jesus gave to Jewish disciples during the age of the gospel of the kingdom, so not everything in it is directly applicable to we who are Gentiles living in the age of the gospel of grace. I want you to get that. I want you to notice the emphasis on the kingdom in this prayer, and especially in the opening line of the prayer. And and chapter 6 of Matthew, the last part of verse 9, first part of verse 10, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, what? 
your kingdom come. That was the emphasis of the gospel of the kingdom. That was the emphasis of their prayer life at that time. But, but today that emphasis is different. And if you read later on in the New Testament, you can see that. And we'll look at that as we go further along. But why is it necessary for our Lord to teach us to pray? Here's why. Because in part from his instruction, we don't know how to pray or for what to pray. Paul, Paul said it like this. I mean, he kind of nails us here when he wrote Romans chapter 8, verse number 26. I'll read this to you from the New International Version, or excuse me, from the New Living Translation. He said this, The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example. Now, he's talking about the Holy Spirit helping us in our weakness, right? And then he's going to give us an example of an area of weakness that we have where the Holy Spirit helps us. So this is what he said. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Is that pretty clear? Now this is Paul writing during the time of the gospel of the grace of God. And he says, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. When you don't know what to pray, if you're just willing for God to do His will, then the Holy Spirit will will articulate that prayer to God on your behalf, and you won't even be able to put it into words. You don't know what to say, but the Holy Spirit does because He knows the mind of God. And so He can pray in you. He can, he can do that. It's amazing that when we don't know exactly what God wants in any given situation, but we truly want what he wants, then the Holy Spirit will communicate the longing of our heart for God's will directly to the Father. So we don't have to know exactly what God wants every time. We just need to want what he wants, whatever that is, and then the Holy Spirit will take it from there. Aren't you glad he does that? At times, we don't even sense our need to pray. (laughs) So so we should plead with our Lord like that early disciple did. Lord, teach us to pray. James, in the book of James, chapter 4, verse number 2, he offered a scathing indictment of the followers of Jesus of his day regarding their lack of urgency in prayer. He wrote this. This is from King James. You have not because you ask not. What was he saying? You don't have something. And maybe it's something you need or something you want or something even God wants you to have. But why don't you have it? No urgency to ask God for it. Why don't you have? Because you don't ask. You see, prayer in that sense teaches us continual dependency on God. The reason we don't have it is we haven't asked God for it. What does that indicate? That in order to get it, it's going to have to come from God, and it means that we're going to have to be dependent upon Him. One of the issues for which God wants us to pray, and one of the reasons that He really wants us to pray, is that it teaches us dependence upon him not to be independent and self-sufficient and arrogant enough to think that i can do this on my own we need to be driven to the point that we recognize our total dependence on him and then urgently pray now i want to give you this too if the ability to pray effectively was something that we were given at the moment we were saved, and some people tend to think that, then there would have been no reason for Jesus' disciple to make the request he did when he said, Lord, teach us to pray. I mean, these guys were already saved. They were saved according to the gospel of the kingdom. They've been following Jesus for three and a half years. They've been baptized by John the Baptist. I mean, they're part of the inner circle. So if, if that was the case, if, if you know how to pray just because you get saved, if that's the case, then Jesus would not have responded in the way he did to that request. And he responded by offering them this model prayer uh, for, from which uh, they could learn to pray. That was his response. This then is how you should pray. And then he gives them that prayer as an example, as a model. 
he would have said something like this. If, if they really already should know how to pray just because they've been saved, this is what he said. You're my disciples. You're saved. You should already know how to pray. But he didn't say that. They wanted to be taught how to pray, and what did he do? He taught them. He gave them that model prayer. And since Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, then his disciples should teach their disciples how to pray. The last thing Jesus said to his disciples before he left them in this world and returned to heaven was this, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That's in Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. So, these 12 guys were his disciples, and then he tells them to go make disciples. If he taught them how to pray and they're going to follow his model of discipleship, then they need to go teach their disciples how to pray. Obviously, teaching people how to pray is an important aspect of the disciple-making process. After all, Jesus didn't say, if you pray. What did he say in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 5? When you pray. You see, prayer is a non-optional part of an effective Christian life. The disciples of Jesus who made the request, Lord, teach us to pray, certainly made the request, especially this one guy who articulated the request on behalf of the group. He made his request to the right person. No one can teach like Jesus can teach. You see, a pupil, and evidently this disciple is placing himself in the role of a pupil because he wants to be taught. A pupil needs a teacher who knows his subject. That's Jesus. Who has the gift of teaching. That's Jesus. Who in patience and love will meet the student's needs. That's Jesus. That's why it is such a privilege that we can be enrolled in Jesus' prayer academy with classes conducted by Jesus himself. He will take his word and teach us how to pray, if we're willing. Regarding his teaching abilities, Nicodemus, a first century in the closet follower of Jesus, said this to him. It's in John chapter 3, verse 2. He said, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. And then a whole conversation broke out from that statement. Matthew referred to his superior teaching abilities when he wrote this in Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29. He said, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The common people of the day recognized that Jesus had superior teaching abilities. So if we want to be taught how to pray... We want to be depending on Jesus to teach us how to do exactly that. So here's a conclusion. To pray effectively. If you really want to learn how to pray and see the power of heaven unleashed on earth, we must be qualified to pray like he told his first century disciples to pray. He said, this then is how you should pray. And then look at the first words in the prayer. Our Father in heaven. Now, if you're reading from the King James, it says, our Father which art in heaven. Same thing. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. You know, he goes on in those, in those first opening lines in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. Now to pray like that, to pray the way he taught us to pray, We must be qualified to honestly address God as our Father in heaven. And he is only our Father if we have been born again. When you get born again, you become a son or a daughter of Jesus or of God because of your belief in Jesus. That's what it means to be born again. He becomes your father, you become his child. And that's why Nicodemus said, uh, in a conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus said to him, you must be born again in John 3, 7. And then a few verses later, Jesus explained how this new birth, 
how this induction into the family of God, becoming his son or his daughter, he explained how it could happen. How you can receive the incredible gift of eternal life and become a son or daughter of God. He explained how that could happen. That's what he said in John 3.16, the most familiar verse in the whole book. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, <clears throat> that whoever believes in him, that means to believe the gospel, believe the good news, believe the Jesus story as it is recorded in the Bible. Whoever does that, whoever believes in him, shall not perish. They won't die and go to hell. But what will they have? Eternal life. When you believe in him, you get this incredible gift of eternal life, and you become a son and daughter of God. That's what he wants for every human being. Unless you have had that experience, you are not qualified to pray the way Jesus wants you to pray because he wants you to pray, our Father which art in heaven. When we go to God and address him as our Father, when we go to him understanding that we can go to him, it's legitimate for us to ask him for what we need because he's our Father. But unless you've had that experience, you can't legitimately address him as your Father because he's not. Now, there may be someone here today who has never heard or believed the gospel, the good news, the Jesus story. And therefore, you're, you're, you recognize, well, you know, if, if I can't pray our father or my father, if I can't pray that, then huh, I'm really not even qualified to pray. I need to know that I really am a son or a daughter of God. I really know, need to know that I have been born again that I do have this incredible gift of eternal life. And here's the thing. You know what happens to somebody in the physical area of life? Do you know what happens to somebody every time they're born? Every physical birth, what happens? That baby is inducted into a family, right? You say, well, that's kind of sad. My family was a mess. <laughs> Mine too. But guess what? Birth always inducts you into a family. You get that? When we're born again, the reason he used that phraseology, being born again, is because when you have that spiritual experience of believing in Jesus and getting this gift of eternal life, being born again, you are inducted into a new family. And that's the family of God. He becomes your father. You become his child. Everybody needs that. And there's only one way to get it. And the Bible makes it very clear that it's all about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about your church. It's not about your denomination. It's not about grandma being a Pentecostal preacher. It's, it's none of that. Or grandpa was a Presbyterian preacher, whatever. None of that. It's about you knowing and believing what the Bible has to say about Jesus and why he's qualified to give you the gift of eternal life. So I want to tell you the story. There might be somebody here today who's never really heard the story and therefore never believed it and therefore does not have eternal life. They're not in the family of God. God is not their father. Therefore, they cannot pray the way he wants us to pray.